What would you say is the most iconic part of a Disney princess movie? Is it true love's kiss? The lovable sidekicks? The gross misrepresentation of historical facts? All of these are valid answers. But I believe that the biggest ingredient in the stew pot that is a classic Disney movie are the songs. More specifically, the princess songs. Can you imagine Snow White without Someday My Prince Will Come? Moana without How Far I'll Go? Mulan without Reflection? Uh, never mind, they actually did do that one. Even though the three original Disney princesses each had songs of their own, it wasn't until The Little Mermaid and the Disney Renaissance that the big princess songs became, you know, a thing. This originated from The Little Mermaid being brought in from the musical theater realm by Howard Ashman and Alan Menken. In fact, it was such an obvious transfer from musicals that the two had originally dubbed Part of Your World as Somewhere That's Dry after their iconic Somewhere That's Green from Little Shop of Horrors. Yes, these are the famed I Want songs. If you couldn't tell by them outright saying I want so and so, be it adventure in the great wide somewhere or to be up where they walk slash run. And yes, the male leads got them too, but it's the princesses that are the most remembered slash marketed. And all Disney princesses trademark get one in their original movies, even Merida, who doesn't even sing. Well, all but one of them. Today, we're talking about Jasmine, Disney's secondary princess. I'm a secondary princess in a secondary role. The spotlight's on the guy who runs the lamp. Now, when I say secondary princess, I don't mean to diminish Jasmine's role in Aladdin and in the Disney brand as a whole, but rather to highlight how she is the only Disney princess, trademark, who is not the lead in her original movie. Arguably, she's not even the due to Ragnus, with the genie being more of a part of the action than she is. Potentially, it was her reduced role in the story that left her without a solo, with her only taking part in a whole new world, which kind of leaves her without a signature sound that is iconically and wholly hers. The lack of a song for Jasmine makes her stand out somewhat amongst the other princesses. Even in Wreck-It Ralph 2, she's weirdly absent from the frame as soon as they start talking about how all princesses suddenly get backing music in a spotlight when they sing about their dreams. Her lack of a solo might be put down to her not being the lead of the movie, but even Meg and Esmeralda get their own songs, even though they're neither the lead nor princesses. With the only other exception to this rule being Nala, who is not a human, so feels like an exception herself. Then we have to consider that every Disney adaptation of Aladdin has featured some kind of new song for dear old Jasmine, so clearly Disney must have realized she could do with a little extra oomph. I mean, they even had completely separate actresses doing the speaking and singing voices for Jasmine in the original movie, these being Linda Larkin and Lea Salonga, so clearly they wanted to ensure that Jasmine could sing just as well as any other princess, even if she didn't get her own song. With all that in mind, here's a not-so-brief look at every single Jasmine song and how well they tied her character together. The four themes we'll be seeing throughout this voyage, popping up and disappearing and reappearing depending on what the writers want, will be romance, Freedom. I just want to be free so badly. Privilege. You slaves could never understand this feeling. And responsibility. I want to make my own choices. I mean, please, is that so much to ask? But decisions are hard. So put all those up on the board as we move forward. Now, for us to understand how Jasmine came about to start with, let's go all the way back to the story of Aladdin and his wonderful lamp, which gives us our first taste of a proto-Jasmine in the form of Princess Bedrobador, a Chinese princess. She is not very interesting. In fact, not only is she considered a prize to be won, but she's kidnapped twice in the story. The first of these is by Aladdin, who magically kidnaps her for a night's on end and forces her to sleep alongside him, with the knife between them being the only form of safety. <sighs> and the second by the Vizier, one of the story's main antagonists. On the plus side, she does get enough agency to poison and murder the Vizier at the behest of Aladdin. No trapping in a magical lamp in that story. It's brutal. Ultimately, the only things that Jasmine gets from this character are her being the princess, her being Aladdin's love interest, her being kept away from the general public, and her being kidnapped by subsequently tricking the antagonist. 
Writing off the wave of Orientalism, there'd be a string of Aladdin adaptations all throughout the years, ditching its originally Chinese background for an Arab one. Funnily enough, this included a Disney fairy tale book in 1978. After their success with The Little Mermaid, Howard Ashman and Alan Menken would create their own movie treatment for the story of Aladdin in the late 80s. They put it forward to Jeffrey Katzenberg, then chairman of Walt Disney Studios, who was not sold on the idea and instead set the two to work on Beauty and the Beast. This first draft featured a number of characters that would later be scrapped, including Aladdin's mom, his three best friends, and Abi, his true love interest, described by Menken as a Judy Garlandy tomboy. Yeah, this version of Aladdin was not meant to end up with the princess, renamed to Jasmine a la 1952's Aladdin and His Lamp, who, instead of being the feisty and freedom-chasing Jasmine we all know and love, was actually an absolute brat. Her description on the movie treatment reads, The ultimate in pampered spoiled brattiness. Think Madeline Kahn or Bernadette Peters in a really bad mood. This interpretation of the character is how she got her very first song, Call Me a Princess, which is all about how unapologetically obnoxious she is. Call me a princess, I don't care. Call me obsessed with nails and hair. Only concerned with what to wear, shallow and so blasé. It's a fun little number where she brags about how she's obsessed with superficial things and how she always gets her dad to do anything she wants. This is where we see the first of Jasmine's themes, privilege. This naturally comes as a result of her being one of Disney's most fortunate princesses, being born into royalty and living her teenage years in wealth, which is a trait shared by surprisingly few other Disney princesses, and this theme will permeate to some capacity in many of her future portrayals. This song doesn't have the slightest bit of the other themes though, to the point where Jasmine literally says she doesn't care about whoever she marries, so long as he's got cold hard cash. However, as the script progressed and the original love interest was scrapped, alongside Aladdin's entire support structure, with the exception of the later added Abu, who went from old man thief to monkey. Jasmine was chosen as the definitive love interest for Ali, and was appropriately made more sympathetic. As her outward brattiness got removed, so was Call Me a Princess, as fun as it was. But she never did get a replacement. How come? Well, long story short, Aladdin received many, many reworks until it was finalized. So many that only three of Ashman and Menken's songs actually made the cut, with the movie's other four songs having been created by Menken and Tim Rice post-Ashman's tragic death. And even then, Menken and Rice had to get rid of various songs that they had made. Menken himself would later state when speaking about Ashman, would he have given Jasmine a new number since his original one didn't fit the character as rewritten? I think he might have. In 1992, Disney's Aladdin was released to the world, far separated from both the original tale and Ashman and Menken's original movie treatment. Nevertheless, it became an instant classic, and Jasmine would become the sixth Disney princess, though the Disney princess brand would only become official nearly a decade later. Her storyline in the movie carries the theme of freedom, which can be seen throughout all the movie's characters. Aladdin is limited by his low birth status, Jasmine by her high birth status, and Genie by his status as a literal slave. Jasmine in particular wants the ability to choose whoever she'll marry, a big change from both the original story and her spoiled princess persona. She also wants to explore the world beyond the palace walls, though this desire gets picked up and dropped multiple times along the franchise. But she doesn't get an I Want song per se, instead taking part in the classic duet A Whole New World. Though this isn't a solo for her, it is her most well-known song. And besides obviously including romance, it is also directly related to her wants, with Aladdin giving her a preview of the freedom she so desires, and her being enamored by it. But it's not quite an I Want song, unlike One Jump Ahead Reprise, where Aladdin gets a moment to reflect on how he wants others to see him beyond his financial status. You see, an I Want song usually sets up a character's storyline, what they're so, so desperately yearned for that they just have to sing. When an emotion becomes too strong for speech, you say. It is then often followed by an action to change your circumstances, or a change of circumstances that happens beyond the character. But A Whole New World provides more of a solution to her issues, as opposed to a moment for her to express them in the first place. Instead, this is what her introduction scene does, including her very, very subtle release of those dang birds. It's odd because the scene has all the build-up and even the climax of an I Want song, 
but instead it's just dialogue. And the introduction of her leitmotif in the movie, Jasmine runs away. Appropriately used for Jasmine running away. This piece is dramatic and daring and feels like it's amping up towards a solo, but it never does. Unfortunately, it doesn't have lyrics we can analyze, and we ain't sideways here doing musical composition analysis. <laughs> so get out. So that's the basic gist that everyone knows. Now it's time to look at the entirety of the Aladdin franchise in chronological order. Buckle in, folks. Fortunately, this wasn't the end of Jasmine's songs and official Disney releases. Unfortunately, it's time to look at what Disney's tried so hard to make us forget, the straight-to-DVD movies. <laughs> Ursula's crazy sister! Aladdin got two sequels out of this little initiative, neither of which feature a solo for Jasmine, whose singing has now been taken over by Liz Calloway. The first sequel was 1994's Aladdin 2 The Return of Jafar, which has Jasmine playing a role even more secondary than the one she played in the original movie. Her singing is limited to taking part in Genie's song, Nothing in the World Like a Friend, where he puts on some questionable accents. I roll up late at all along the great, great wall. And Forget About Love, where she's upset at Aladdin for not confiding in her about harboring infamous war criminal Iago. What follows is Gilbert Gottfried squawking his way through the song, reverse psychologying her to forgive Aladdin. And you'll never get enough. Just forget about love. And it works. You're calling my bluff, I can't just forget, forget about, about love. love. And then we get the other sequel in 1996, Aladdin and the King of Thieves. Once again, she takes a backseat as a character and only gets one song, the duet Out of Thin Air. People like you don't come out of thin air. Which is really just about her relationship with Aladdin with her being happy to delay their wedding as he works through his daddy issues. Won't it be great to have your father see our wedding day? Truth be told, though it isn't a solo and it isn't focused exclusively on Jasmine or anything, this song is actually pretty good in its message of reaching a healthy compromise so that your partner can figure things out for themselves. I don't know, it's just nice to see healthy long-term relationships in a Disney movie, even if it means Jasmine doesn't get to do much else. So, yeah, in 90s animation canon, Jasmine's only solo would be the intro she'd have for her Disney Princess VHS cassette tapes, which were just collections of Jasmine-centric Aladdin TV show episodes. Let's play princess, flying around and around. It may sound like an absolute jam, but it's also the exact same song that was used for Ariel's tapes with appropriately changed lyrics, so I don't know if I can really count it. Let's play princess. In the meantime, 1993 would debut the first ever onstage adaptation of Disney's Aladdin. It wouldn't be on Broadway, and it wouldn't be on a Disney theme park, but rather on ice. This was Walt Disney's World of... <laughs> what is this title? This was Walt Disney's World on Ice, Aladdin. Thankfully recorded and released on tape. Shockingly enough, it somehow featured Jasmine's first official I Want song. But it ain't exactly a solo, and it isn't entirely hers either. Uh, let's just go back to the 1992 movie for a second. As previously stated, a big theme of the story is freedom. The genie, who again is a literal slave, is the most obvious example of this. And he was supposedly meant to have a solo reflecting this, a little piece called To Be Free, where he would say how the one thing he would wish for himself is freedom. The lyrics to this original version have disappeared through time, and honestly, I'm not even sure whether it really existed, because whenever this is mentioned, no sources are given. Nevertheless, the song was apparently scrapped as a full-on number, supposedly because of it being placed right between the genie's two other higher energy songs, and it was consequently replaced by dialogue expressing his desire. But oh, to be free. The melody would be present in the final product as a leitmotif for the character, but that's about it. Until the Walt Disney World Aladdin Ice on World Disney Aladdin on Ice, that is. But instead of representing the genie, To Be Free would be used for Jasmine. And 
yeah, it's sung by a chorus of unseen voices and not her, but still, look at her go, I'd say that counts as a solo number. This version only has a couple of lyrics, which are both pretty vague and really difficult to hear. These were the lyrics Jack and I were able to transcribe, but like, they could be anything. The inclusion of the song gives Jasmine a proper I want moment, and it's actually how the show opens up, or at least how the recorded version does. Oh, it'd be wonderful to see the world outside this palace, to be free. It's sweet, it's powerful, it's brief, but strong nonetheless. The themes of freedom obviously connect to Jasmine, and they even feature that super subtle bird release here, but even so, it's still a recycled song. And for all we know, this might have even been the original lyrics that the genie was meant to sing, especially because it is used again for a duet between the two leads, as its lyrics really are so vague that they could be used for any of the story's leads. Finally, in all likelihood, this song was probably only included to give Jasmine's performer, Olympic figure skater Christy Yamaguchi, more time on stage, which she makes the most out of. The fact that they also gave her a whole new world solo as she daydreams about her dreamy boy from the market also shows how much they wanted to milk her casting in the show. Also, do yourself a favor and watch all of the show on YouTube. It's interspersed with these really cheesy clips of the performers walking about Cairo, because apparently the movie's cultural background wasn't confusing enough as it was, and features some amazingly 90s screen screen. Moving on, the Aladdin franchise wouldn't have another major entry or adaptation until 2003, where the Hyperion Theater and Disney California Adventure debuted its new show, Disney's Aladdin, a musical spectacular. This little show, much like other Disney theme park shows, basically sums up the movie in an hour, and it gives Jasmine an honest-to-god solo that is entirely hers and entirely about her bloodline. Right after scolding Prince Ali's initial advances, she stands alone in her balcony, lamenting her woesome woes, the music amps up, the spotlight's on her, and it's to be free again. But it's now been mixed with bits of the Jasmine Runs Away theme from the original movie, perfectly incorporating the song into the rest of the Aladdin soundtrack. It even got brand new lyrics that are just for her storyline, putting the bird in the cage metaphor into words, thus becoming its own new song in a lot of ways. Lucky bird inside the it further differentiates from Disney on Isis to be free by appearing later in the show, and instead of being empowering and exciting, it's more wistful in its musicality. This version actually tackles both privilege and freedom as themes. She acknowledges how she has everything she could possibly want, and how one would think she shouldn't ask for more, but maintains how the only thing she truly wants is freedom, and it only mentions wanting a true love at the very end, so it's still a song that's more about her than anything else with Aladdin only showing up after the song. Ali! <laughs> this neat little show would be replaced with Frozen Live at the Hyperion after a whopping 13 years, which is surprisingly still less than Disney's Hollywood Studios' version of Beauty and the Beast, which is still somehow trudging along after 30 years. And then in 2007, we got the movie that was supposedly the final nail in the coffin to Disney straight-to-DVD releases. Disney Princess, Enchanted Tales, Follow Your Dreams. Why are all these titles so long? This film includes two shorts, one about Aurora at her absolute worst drawn self, and one about dear old Jasmine, who finally gets to be the lead through and through. Unfortunate it had to be under such circumstances. She gets two songs here, and Leia Salonga returns to be her singing voice. The first of these is More Than a Peacock Princess, where she talks about how she wants to do more important duties than just stand there and look pretty. I'm more than a peacock princess, I am. And it's somehow another song with Iago. Oh good, another one. Why did they keep pairing these two up for songs anyway? <laughs> I had sex with Iago! <laughs> This song finally introduces the last of her ongoing themes, giving her a layer of desiring responsibility, wishing she could do more important things, because apparently the duties of the Princess of Agrabah includes introducing camel shows. 
it's a badly written short. What could you really expect? I can find a cure. I can help the poor. And it's generic orientalist sound kind of leaves a weird taste in your mouth. I don't know if that's just me. And she also gets her first ever movie solo here. I've got my eyes on you. And it's about taming a horse. It's interesting in that the horse was actually her late mother's, who was the only one who could ride him. But much like every other dead mom related plot in Disney sequels and remakes, it feels a bit tacked on. <laughs> much like the previous song, this one can also be linked back to responsibility, as that is what pushes her to understand that being headstrong isn't enough. She also needs to be patient. She even gets in a line about being underestimated, which will return in a second. And Through this mini-adventure, the lesson Jasmine ultimately learns is to be strong and never give up. Yeah, this is a straight-to-DVD movie made for a three- to six-year-old, so it's forgivable for its simplicity and the fact that it doesn't really push Jasmine's character in a brand new direction, but it actually lays some groundwork for Jasmine's future, even if no one watched this movie. Aladdin would be officially adapted for the stage one more time, and this time it would be a full-on, high-budget, two-hour-long musical. Obviously, by stretching the story out even beyond the original movie, it only makes sense to give the story's leading lady some kind of solo. And according to Courtney Reed, who originated the role of Jasmine on Broadway, To Be Free was actually used in the original script reading, but it wouldn't make it past that point. <laughs> Instead, this production announced that it would be bringing back a couple of things from the initial drafts of Aladdin, including Aladdin's friends and various cut songs. My initial agenda when we brought the show to Broadway was, I really want to bring in the, the songs that, I'd, that Howard and I had written and it didn't make it into the movie. And in its initial Seattle run in 2011, one of these was, to everyone's surprise, Call Me a Princess. <laughs> You know, that song about Jasmine being shallow and spoiled? Yeah, it actually was brought back. And despite seeming absolutely out of place in paper, it actually was pretty smartly incorporated into the movie's story. Instead of existing to show Jasmine's true personality and desires, it portrays her putting on a bratty facade as a means of scaring off potential suitors. Though this number didn't contribute much to building up her character, it demonstrated her resourcefulness and echoed back to the idea of being perceived as one-dimensional that Aladdin goes through in one jump ahead reprise. It even gets a very short reprise as she heads off into the market. There might just come a day when princesses run away. This version of Call Me a Princess was just Ashman and Menken's original gone unchanged, aside from removing a not very PC line. Ruling these darn third world nations. But it received further changes when the production was moved to Toronto, adding a spoken word section about all her demands to whoever wishes to marry her. Although it was a good attempt at inserting this deleted song into the Aladdin mythos, it was removed before the show even made it to Broadway. We used to sing it in Seattle and Toronto, and then we came to Broadway, and now I sing another song. <laughs> According to Mencken himself, this removal occurred due to the fact that Call Me a Princess didn't allow the audience to create an emotional connection with Jasmine, which is echoed by what I've seen many people say about it. The, uh, the effect was we were not really establishing enough of an emotional connection with Jasmine, that was the thought. As a result, during Broadway previews, an entirely new song would take its place. Why shouldn't I fly so far from here? I know the These palace walls occurs right after Jasmine rejects her potential suitors, with her confiding in her ladies-in-waiting about how much she yearns to run away and experience life beyond said palace walls, referencing the following line from the movie. I've never even been outside the palace walls. This, much like Disney on Ice is to be free, represents a rare moment where she's introduced with a straightforward I want song as she questions her role as a princess and wonders what it would be like outside her little world. A princess must say this. A princess must wear that. A princess must marry a total stranger. 
It's a pretty song and it fulfills its purpose well enough, but it does come across as a bit of a rich person problem song. It's like I'm a prisoner in a really, really, really nice prison. And it isn't much of a solo either, with her ladies taking up most of the second verse. The musical also features a new duet between Aladdin and Jasmine as they lament their restricted lives and dream about a free life together in a million miles away. When you choose to lose yourself, I like Which flows her desires of freedom and romance even more explicitly into a whole new world later on. Although it does come quite suddenly considering these two just met. In 2013, Jasmine got brought into the 3D animation world, for better or worse, by appearing in the Disney Junior TV show, Sophia the First, where she gets the song, The Ride of Our Lives. Grab the carpet by the tassels, get set, jump on, and fly. <sighs> Look, I don't even know what to say about this. It's about her teaching these darn kids how to drive a fine carpet. Left! It's listening! Ah! It's more of a tutorial song that to me sounds straight out of an 80s commercial. And obviously it's got no connection to the theme, so... <clears throat> and we finally reach the last stop on this magic carpet ride, the 2019 Aladdin remake. Unlike the stage adaptations of the movie, this straight up alters Jasmine's storyline. Her arc isn't just about wanting the freedom not to have to marry out of duty, but now it's been extended to her wanting to become the new sultan, with a desire of bettering the lives of those in Agrabah. It's them, the people, they make it beautiful. And yes, the overuse of terms such as modern and empowerment when it comes to this new characterization is a bit much, but having now gone through all these other incarnations of Jasmine, it's actually a nice bit of fresh air. As mentioned, her wanting more responsibility had been ever so slightly approached in Disney Princess, Enchanted Tales, Yabba Dabba Doo, and she'd even had the occasional line in other pieces of media about how the people outside the palace live. But incorporating it into the storyline of the original movie does actually give her side of the story a bit more depth. Like Legally Blonde the musical altering the ending so that it's Elle that proposes to Emmett, the remake changes the ending so that Jasmine doesn't just get to pick who will quote unquote take care of her, but instead she gets to become the new Sultana. The solo she gets here reflects this new side plot. All I know is I won't go speechless. speechless is divided into two parts, the first one happening early on in the film, with her dad and Jafar insisting that she must marry soon and the second being near the end of the movie, as Jafar puts his evil plans into action. This division is kind of like memory in Cats, with the setup of the song early on, and it coming back around as a seven o'clock, it's a seven o'clock number. <laughs> and it coming back around as the 11 o'clock number, closing out the character's plotline with an emotional high. Don't you want to me? This song was based on Jafar's line from the original movie. You're speechless, I see. A fine quality in a wine. I will never marry you. And it shows Jasmine wanting to break free not only from the laws that dictate her role in the society she lives in, but also from the coup d'etat that's happening literally right in front of her. It's definitely a valid song for representing her new role, but it has a few itsy bitsy problems. Firstly, part two comes so out of nowhere that the movie literally has to freeze the scene so she can sing the song. Secondly, it's far removed from the rest of the soundtrack, lacking much of Aladdin's uniqueness in sound or lyrics, despite being made alongside Menka. At least it has the mention of sand and unbending rules, so it's a bit of a step up from Paul and Pasek's other major musical film, The Greatest Showman, where all but one of its songs can be removed entirely from its context. One could say that Speeches and The Greatest Showman songs were made with the idea of generating commercial success for their own tracks, as opposed to, you know, fitting in well with the narrative of their movies, but that's a story for another day. Ultimately, Speechless just kind of sounds like the 11th track on a 12th track Kelly Clarkson CD. I know I'm being hard on it, but that's just because I think it could have been better. I genuinely really like this version of Jasmine and the remake as a whole, except for this song. I'll even defend how it's a bit on the nose, because I feel like with Jasmine's new storyline, there was no way for it not to be. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it's not like her other songs were exactly subtle. I can find a cure, I can help the poor. Also, not gonna lie here, her wanting more than just freedom at least makes her seem a little bit less caught up in her own problems while people are literally starving to death outside the palace. Also, Jasmine was never really speechless per se, but I understand where the song is coming from in regards to people not actually hearing what she has to say. How dare you? I 
am not a prize to be won. The song is good on paper and execution, even if it's well sung. So don't come for me, Naomi Scott stands. I know you're out there. She was also meant to have a short distant duet with Aladdin, a brief ballad that the two had learned in their childhoods called Desert Moon. Desert Moon. Like Speechless, this song does fit somewhat into the sound of the music. It's entirely about their romance as opposed to their individual plot lines, but it's cute, with them singing about how even when they're far apart, the moon and the sky still shows that they can find each other. But alas, it was cut from the movie, probably for it not necessarily advancing the story. Not that Speechless does, but whatever. And that's where Jasmine's songs have ended. In total, she's had 11 completely different solos slash songs where she's one of the leads, 13 if you count the slight variations. It's a resume in a bit for Disney's secondary princess, huh? Two of these address privilege, five freedom, three responsibility, and six romance, with the obvious outliers being Let's Play Princess and The Ride of Our Lives, which honestly, I don't even know why I put them on this list. Jasmine's character has evolved significantly throughout time from her initial conceptualization, and all these songs reflect multiple songwriters' attempts, especially on Menkins, to bring her personality from dialogue to music. With a sequel to the live action Aladdin being on the horizon, who knows if Jasmine will get another song to add to her pile. Whatever the case may be, let me know what you guys think. Which of these songs is your favorite? Do any of her solos compare to the shining, shimmering splendor of a whole new world? Did I choose this really specific topic just so I could live my obnoxious Disney gay life? Who knows? I hope you've enjoyed the video. Like and subscribe for more miscellaneous musical content. And I'll see you guys next time. Hopefully it won't take as long next time.